the key book was really Lolita. Uh, Lolita was, um, was the first really important book I published uh, with Olympia Press. And uh, it was also a very important book in, uh, in, the, uh, in the history of the fight against censorship. Because uh, uh, what happened is that uh, I was asked to send a copy of that book in America when censorship made it absolutely impossible to send anything. You see, I mean, it was absolutely illegal to send uh, books to America and the, uh, of the Olympia Press type. And uh, the uh, American customs were very vigilant about it. And uh, they had uh, specially trained uh, inspectors to open all those brown paper parcels. And uh, when I uh, decided to send that copy to this man who wanted to see a copy of uh, Lolita, uh, I knew there was a 50% chance that it would be stopped. But three months later, I got a uh, note saying that he had received the book, he had enjoyed it a lot, but the book had been apparently stopped by the uh, customs in New York. It had been read and uh, had been sent on and he knew this because there was a little note uh, to that effect by a customs officer called Irving Fishman and I uh, decided to write to this man Irving Fishman and ask him why uh, what had happened see and uh, he said that indeed uh, they had read the, the book they had found it uh, uh, acceptable for importation in the United States and uh, signed Irving Fishman and uh, therefore I had a statement uh, coming from the uh, federal customs uh, concerning the book which was a legal precedent which I could use in court in order to defeat any effort to ban Lolita in America. And this piece of paper was worth millions of dollars. Uh, it was also the beginning of the end for censorship in America. This was the first book uh, which uh, broke down the censorship barrier. The second one was Lady Shah's Lover uh, the following year. And uh, in 1960, it was Tropic of Cancer. And then all of my other authors were published one after the other. Uh, there was Candy, of course, but uh, also uh, the books by William Burroughs, Naked Lunch, and uh, Jean Genet, and so on. And uh, the courts were totally, uh, I mean, had to change their, their, their habits and their opinions about, uh, about this type of literature. And this, in turn, uh, created a movement in the magazines and the press and films. And this was the end of the censorship in America. Another thing that I'm working on now is uh, even more bizarre, maybe, it's a world anthology of human beauty. Uh, after the sexual revolution, we need uh, a beauty revolution, that is to, to, uh, to show the uh, real face of, uh, of humanity. And uh, what I feel is that, uh, you know, we, there's a lot of talk about ethnicity, about um, ethnic cultures, and I think that uh, what defines uh, ethnicity before everything else is the ideal of uh, beauty for a specific group, cultural group or ethnic group. Uh, the d dimension of beauty is something that uh, uh, irritates people a lot, but I think that's good, you see. I think that uh, people will think, should think in terms of beauty much more, uh, you know, each time you talk uh, about someone about uh, this problem of beauty, I mean, they immediately look into the mirror and they look silly, and I think that's, uh, that just proves that the taboo uh, has to be absorbed, has to be uh, uh, overcome. It really sounds like a uh, uh, cultural political area that you're entering into. Yes, here, it uh, is. But also yeah. something very uh, deep in uh, Western yes. psychology yes. of the uh, dominant stamp of uh, the white race mm -hmm. concept of yes. beauty. And Yes, I mean the uh, well. You see the uh, those uh, that Mu Miss Universe uh, beauty contest. Uh, well, you know in advance that uh, this is a uh, propaganda stunt for the white race, for the white man.
recent ventures into space have opened to mankind frontiers and possibilities that were previously unimaginable. The technologies of space exploration have provided us with a plethora of new information, images, and perspectives. Humans have gone from seeing the planet as a vast engulfing universe to actually observing it as a single fragile sphere. Ultimately, humanity changes its own nature through the use of its imagination. Humanity can control its own evolution. Space exploration and the development of space technology have tremendous potential for changing human perspectives and therefore human nature. Science and art have ultimately been responsible for cultural change. Social changes have always followed the technological changes first instituted jointly by science and art. Now science and technology advance rapidly and the amounts and quality of information increases. It is imperative that the artist keep pace and fulfill his responsibilities in this advance. Yet now, scientific te and technological discoveries often remain confined to the circles that develop them. By consequence, outer space is still a non-vital abstraction to most of the planet. We see outer space as a most vital abstraction for our times. It is what our futures on Earth or beyond its shell are made of. We, Space Force, are interested in the expansion of man's awareness of outer space through the creative use of related hardware and software. We seek a collaboration of science and art. As a group, we see a more integrated function for the purpose of the artist in society as the presenter, the disseminator, and the demystifier of ideas and possibilities. In outer space, we see a limitless frontier for humanitarian, cultural, and utilitarian functions. Our purpose is to present ideas, energy, and desires towards richer, more diversified visions from outer space. In the spirit of the probes, vanguard, and pioneer, Space Trust proposes a series of artist design programs which would utilize the enormous body of scientific and technological material now available, with the ultimate goal of preparing mankind to manage its future in a responsible and creative manner.